Jason. I'm your host, Whitney Davis. And joining us today is Jason King from Sean's Outlook. And I could not be happier with him joining us. I think the work that he has been doing is exactly the direction I want to take this show. Um, you know, I'm guilty of this myself, but it seems that a lot of people limit themselves to education as a means for spreading liberty. And I think that it may be more effective to show people real-world examples of how we're using alternative currencies, alternative methods, and helping people without the use of force. So um, let me introduce you. Jason, thank you for joining. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Okay, so could you tell us just a little bit about um, your background, Sean's Outpost, maybe what inspired it? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so um, I, I was a tech entrepreneur. Um, I ran an ISP, a um, couple of startups. I was a network engineer um, and um, retired in 2009 um, and um, sort of bounced around doing some, some things and ended up back in my hometown in 2012. I'm sorry, 2013. Um, and... Um, my, my best friend, Sean Dugas, was murdered. Um, he was a reporter for the Pensacola News Journal here. Um, and uh, in trying to keep his memory alive, um, my wife and I started Sean's Outpost, which is um, a homeless outreach here in Pensacola. And um, sort of through serendipity, um, we've, we've become sort of intertwined with the cryptocurrency community, and we're now the largest uh, Bitcoin-based charity in the world. Um, we just fed our 100,000th meal to the homeless, um, we operate Satoshi Forest, which is a nine-acre homeless sanctuary here, uh, and we're 100% funded by cryptocurrencies. I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know the background to that. I was wondering why it was called Sean, and not Jason. But, and, uh, and, yeah, and so people all the time call me Sean, and then I get to tell them about my wonderful friend um, who passed away too early, but who are who the outpost is named after. So that's a great thing that you're doing. Um, I think I read that you guys raised over 700 victims. Yeah, um, yeah, total. I think it's you know, uh, it's probably more than that now. I think at our year anniversary, we're like 723, um, which sounds like a whole lot of money right now. But you got to think that uh, you know, Bitcoin was under 100 for a large period of time um, when we were raising that, and so. Uh, you know, 700 bitcoins is worth a whole lot more today than it would. Yeah. <laughs> like. well, um, but uh, but yeah, but we uh, we we still are continue to be 100 percent funded by cryptocurrency. So that that's is great. so incredible because you know you don't think that many people use it that much, but I guess it's growing in popularity. Who who are the people? What what demographic would you say donate to you? What demographic donates? Is that what you yeah. said? Yeah. Um, I don't know that we ha we really have a demographic. I mean, it's everything from just like, you know, some random person in another country that thinks it's screwed up, that people are starving to death on the streets in Florida, um, to, you know, companies that want to help out, to celebrities, to, to whoever, you know. it's And that's the wonderful thing about Bitcoin is that it really um, sort of levels the playing field and it allows you to tell your story to the whole world so you're no longer just, you know, reduced to your local area to fundraise, you can be like, hey, things are really screwed up here. We're really trying to make a difference. Um, is anyone interested in helping? And then if you are, you know, you can, you know, voluntarily give of your treasure to, to support a cause that you believe in. And, you know, I think Sean's Outpost has done a good job of, of showing that in action, that, you know, that people, you know, libertarians and anarchists get a bad rap for being uncaring, you know, because... A lot, we're not really for social programs in terms of we don't, for the most part, want people to steal our money to go help somebody else. But it doesn't mean that we don't want to help other people. We just want to do it sort of on our own terms, you know, and voluntarily. And I think Sean's Outpost has done a good job of showing that people really do want to help. They just, you know, they maybe they want some accountability in it. They want to actually see that the, the help is going on, and they don't want to trust a government or an institution um, to just take their money, you know, because they're going to spend it better than you would. I, that's exactly why I wanted you on, actually, because because we do get accused of, you know, every man for himself, and you know we may believe in personal responsibility, but that doesn't mean that we 
can't help other people. And so it's good to have examples out there showing that you can help other people without taking from other people. So you can help voluntarily. For sure. And so, I mean, for, for all of you liberty activists out there, I would actually say that there's probably not a better thing that you can do to sort of poke holes in the government veil um, than to go out and help other people because it's sort of supposed to be the government game, right? It's like, like that's what we do. We take your money and then we go, we take care of all the people you wouldn't take care of because you're selfish and you suck. So, um, so when you prove that as a private individual that you actually will go out and do this and, and also, you know, do it more efficiently, more cost-effectively, um, and more transparently, you are literally just pulling the curtain back on that whole sham that, you know, this is what government's supposed to be doing. Um, and that's, uh, it, 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 we've gotten tremendous opposition from our government, um, you know, our, our municipal government, our county government, um, for that exact reason, is we make them look really bad. Um, because we, we do what they they're supposed to be doing better. So. What have they done? Um, well, so um, we've actually been taken to court four times over for Satoshi Forest um, because they've claimed that we don't have the right to allow people to camp on private property. Um, yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> if you own it, um. yeah, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. It. Right, yeah, and so it's really funny too because so that Satoshi Forest was um, in response to this series of terrible um, homeless ordinances the city of Pensacola passed that has essentially made it illegal to be homeless here. And one of the cornerstones of that was is that you can't camp on public property. Um, so, like, you know, if you're homeless and you're at a park camping out, they can just come arrest you, you know, just for being poor, essentially. Um, so we were like, okay, cool. Well, we're going to get some private property, and then you guys can camp here. And then it's, you know, they specifically said in all of their arguments, you know, this doesn't prevent... You know, private property, you can camp on private property, that's fine, it's just public property, because it's all propaganda and bullshit. And then as soon as we got some private property, we started bringing people out there. Oh, well, you know, you can't have homeless people camping out there. And I mean, like, the the assertions they made were ridiculous. They were like, well, look, you could have a commercial campground, but because there's no commerce going on, because you're just letting homeless people stay here, you don't have the right to do that. I mean, just like, just ridiculous arguments. Um, and, you know, in Pensacola, we have over a 1,000 homeless people on the streets here. We have about 30 permanent social, I mean, shelter beds here. So every night there's a 1,000 people on the street, and we were just giving people a place to stay. And the, the amount of, you know, taxpayer dollars and effort that they put into trying to stop us is just astronomical. I mean, it's just really been terrible. Um, but fortunately, so far, knock on wood, we've been successful in every time they've taken us to court, and we've ended up um, the victor. <laughs> Um, but I mean, but it's just a matter of time. It's also, it's almost like, um, it, it's almost like we're doing penetration testing for them. Like, like they're like looking for. So, like, we went on that front. So now they're going to go find another front to attack us on. So, and you're just trying to help people, <laughs> and they're stopping yeah. you, from, trying to stop you from helping. That's yeah, it's it's um it's really ridiculous. Um, they actually um. In a meeting with the with the county, we were actually like, "Look, you know, we're just trying to help homeless people, people that have nowhere else to go. It's not like we're trying to open a strip club." And the county was like, "Well, you might actually get a permit for a strip club. Like, ah. you, like you, you could have a strip club. You just can't help homeless people. I mean, it's just it's it's ludicrous." And 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 you know, I I'm new to the liberty movement. Um, I, I you know I'm I've kind of just gotten my anarchy wings you know, not too long ago, um, and it's because, uh, you know, I'm a white privileged male, it, you know, I, a lot of this didn't, I didn't have run-ins with anyone, you know, like it didn't affect me, I had a, you know, a fairly comfortable life, um, you know, I was a successful entrepreneur, uh, I'm a U.S. Army veteran, like this, this stuff didn't, I just didn't realize there was an, it was an issue because it didn't directly affect me until I started helping homeless people. <laughs> And literally, just like it's like I flipped a switch. It's like everyone, like everyone, for in the government is just completely against it. It's like you know, you're supposed to s say that you want to help homeless people, but actually, the act of helping the poor and downtrodden is actually like a forbidden act. Like you shouldn't do that. Um, so it's it's uh, it's crazy. It, I would have never guessed it, but uh, but it opened my eyes as to sort of like how the system really works. Um, so so I'm awake now. <laughs> 
Have you considered opening a strip club for homeless people? What was that? <laughs> Have you considered opening a strip club for homeless people? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that you could do that. Well, so that that uh, they don't have any money. It's like you know, I don't know that we can keep it. I'm, you know, I I'd like to be a successful entrepreneur. I don't I don't know that that's really a <laughs> really a successful venture there. <laughs> and so, um, I was reading earlier that you ran across America. I did. Uh, yeah. I, I just finished. Um, I guess it's been about a month now. Um. In, on January 26th, I left from uh, Miami Beach, Florida, um, and I ran to San Francisco, California, like physically ran um, in a project called Bitcoin Across America to raise awareness for both Bitcoin and the homeless epidemic in America. And I got there on June 7th of last last year. I mean, sorry, of last month. Um, and so it was uh, 3,237 miles over about four and a half months. Um, <laughs> running across the country. Yeah, how did you do that? <laughs> Were you literally running every day, or did you take some breaks? And... Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I averaged 31.7 miles a day, um, but I did I took days off. Like, I had to fly to a couple of conferences. I got sick a couple of times. Um, you know, you do what you have to do. But, uh, but yeah, pretty much I was on the road for four and a half months running. Um, I lost 72 pounds. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, raised 205 bitcoins. Um, hey, there we go. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was uh, it was an adventure, I, and it was uh, it was great. But it's like it really, you know, I ran through some of the poorest areas of the country, and just like we're in a bad state, you know, uh, like it's it's bad out there, and you know, if you think that it's not, you're not paying attention, um, and that's really all that it is. And, uh, you know, there I met Pensacola is terrible to be homeless. I met people in New Mexico who were, who were like, I'm just trying to get to Pensacola because if I could get to Pensacola, it would be better than it is here. And so it's like, it, it's terrible. Um, there's sort of this, you know, politics is like all about, to be a successful politician, you have to have someone to blame. Because um, if, like, if you can't tell someone who's at fault and that you're going to do something about it, then no one wants to vote for you. Um, so... I don't know at what point in time um, we've declared this war on the poor, and so like the poor and the homeless have have are now apparently the prob why there's a bad economy, because you know the people who have no money are apparently responsible for the reason why there's no money. Um, but across, the, I mean, so it's like it's an epidemic. Like they just the homeless get treated terribly pretty much everywhere, um, and they just they get blamed for. Lack of tourism. They get blamed for businesses shutting down. They get blamed for you know we have a terrible economy and they basically just be like oh it's the homeless you know if people weren't homeless it would be a great economy it's just, you know it just doesn't make any sense. Um, did you happen to run through Arkansas? I'm just curious. I'm from there. I, I did not run through Arkansas. Um, uh, you know, I ran through Louisiana and Texas, but I didn't I didn't get to Arkansas. Well, that's cool. <laughs> Um, Are you from okay. Arkansas? Yes. Okay. I'm from um, right north of Little Rock, and there's a lot of poor areas in Arkansas. South Arkansas and right in the middle of the state. Pretty bad. It, it's kind of interesting because you don't have homeless people as in what people see in cities. We have people that are literally, they lost their home. They yeah, no. So we have that here, too. Um, it's like... Um, we get hurricanes and um, and they just destroy houses and then you know every time there's a hurricane your ability to get insurance uh, decreases so it's like um, an area will get really ravaged and then so insurance companies will just draw on the map that they're going to not insure these areas because they took a lot of losses in those areas so they're, they're going to be uninsurable so if you rebuild in those areas and then your house gets destroyed again you don't have insurance um, so I mean, so there's lots of there's lots of things like that that go on in the Gulf Coast where people's houses get destroyed and they just never come back. Um, and so you know they're like, oh, I had a house, now I don't, now I live under a bridge. Um, so yeah, it's terrible. Um, I did have someone that wanted me to ask you if you were willing to work with schools in Florida for alternative spring break. If you're are you familiar with alternative spring break? 
I am I am not familiar with alternative spring break. Um, um, why don't you educate me about alternative okay. spring break? <laughs> so from my experience with alternative spring break, there where people instead of going to parties, um, they volunteer and go help out somewhere. And so I think the person was wondering if you would coordinate with schools there, um, because he's from Florida, he's from Gainesville. So cool. He was probably wondering if you were coordinating with schools that already want to volunteer. Um, we're not currently, um, but it sounds like a good idea. Um, uh, yeah, we would love to do that. We, are, we always take volunteers. Um, there's always more work to be done, literally. There's always way more work than we have manpower for. Um, so, yeah, so I would love to, to learn more about that. So what would you say if someone lives there, or maybe even someone that doesn't live there, how can they help out if they want to volunteer or if they want to donate? So, um, you know, I think more importantly than donating to Sean's outpost is is that like you can just help the homeless in your area, and and you don't and it's really important that people realize that you don't need an institution and you don't need a you know you don't need to go find a five hundred one c three registered charity to help someone. Is that literally it can be as simple as go make a couple of sandwiches and go out and give them to dudes on the street. It's that that simple. I mean that's that's literally what we started doing. Like we were just like we made a couple of sandwiches and then we handed them out. And then we talk to the people we gave them to, and then, you know, you do that a couple of times, they actually start to trust you, they actually start to build rapport with you, they actually start realizing what the real situation is, you know, and, and here we are a year and a half later, and we've f given out 100,000 sandwiches. Um, it, it doesn't take, you know, you don't have to, 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 there's this stigma that you need, you know, you need to go find this a church or you need to go find a, you know, a registered charity and then you have to follow that path and that's not true. You can just, you can do direct action. You can just see someone who needs help and go help them. Um, and if we all did that, if we all just, you know, there's 1.5 million homeless people and there's, you know, 300 million Americans. So literally if, if one in every 300 people just like took it upon themselves to go take care of a homeless person, we wouldn't really have a homeless problem. Um, so, yeah, like, I don't know, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but yeah, you can really yeah, just, do it or just go help people yourself. Because I was going to ask you for advice, and I think that's exactly what you would say. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and we're starting Sean's Outposts up um, other places. We've got one that's going real strong in Dallas now. Um, we're opening in Toronto and Vancouver very short, shortly. Um, we're opening in Miami. Um, and then we've got some international chapters um, in uh, coming online in London and Stockholm as well. Um, you know, so if someone's interested in being affiliated with Sean's Outpost and wants to, you know, help in their local area, feel free to contact us. But also realize that you don't have to contact us. That you really can just go help people on your own. You don't need to, you know, fly a flag or, or you know, have special powers to go help people. You can really just care. Like, and even if you don't have money to buy food, truthfully, one of the um, most beneficial things you can do is just talk to somebody. If you see somebody on the street that's not doing well, just say hi and just treat them like a human being because that's what's missing in their life is they get, you know, they're marginalized. They get looked at like garbage all the time. So if you'll actually stop and take a moment to connect with that person as a real human, then, you know, that actually does a whole lot. And a lot of times that'll do more than giving them a sandwich or a dollar, just, you know, talking to them and treating them like a real person. Um, it's, it's important for people to do. Um. What would you say? Cause Diet Mountain Dew. <laughs> and I like your shirt, by the way. You want to show that off a little bit? Teenage Mutant <laughs> Ninja Turtles. Heroes in the Half Shell. Turtle Power. Who's your favorite? Do you have a favorite? I was actually I was a homeless person today over the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Um, because uh, Megan Fox is going to play April, and Megan Fox is not a natural redhead, so are they going to make her a redhead, or is she not going to be a redhead, and they're going to ruin the whole April being a redhead motif. Um, so, yeah, actually, I had a conversation today with a homeless dude in Martin Luther King Park just about the, the upcoming Ninja Turtle movie. So, good times. <laughs> Do you think maybe you could take some homeless people to the movie? Uh, that's out? actually not a bad idea. You should totally do a, a homeless night out of the movies. Yeah, I, I was actually going to say this when I was introducing you, is that you're a pretty legit guy. 
because we were going to record earlier, but something came up and you were helping the whole time. <laughs> so um, that's really awesome. It was um, really funny too. Is that um, I got I got your invitation request and it came through my email, and my phone. And I was like, oh crap! I have this interview right now, and I, I was literally out at a homeless camp, and I was like, hey. Where's the closest place that has free Wi-Fi? And they're like, Visitor Center. So, like, homeless guys directed me to go over to be able to connect and tell you that I needed to reschedule the interview. So, yeah, pretty <laughs> legit. Um, what would you say? So, from something that I've observed, you know, I live in Los Angeles now. So there's a lot of homeless people here. Oh, so um, bad. What about those that are addicted to drugs? You know, how can we help those? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, so I'm a recovered meth addict, um, and or I, you know, uh, recovering. I don't think you ever really kick it. Like I, I think you're always an, probably an addict. Um, you just are, learn to function or learn to you not use. Um, and until you're until you're willing to to stop, I don't know that there's help for you. So obviously, you know, drug treatment programs and stuff have some level of help. But if you if you're really not willing to get help, there's not help for you. Um, but um, the stigma that like everyone on the street is a drug user is just is false. It's just it's just not true. It's it's a really um, it's a really simple thing for people to be able to write off another a whole set of humanity is they just be like, oh they're all just drug addicts. You know, they're all, everybody on the street's just drug addicts. We had that here um, literally last week we had a series of raids on homeless camps in Pensacola where cops just came in and evicted homeless people, cut down tents, kicked everybody out, and um, and like we've got video and audio of talking to these officers and they're like, look, I've been a I've been a police officer for 20 years and everybody on the streets is a drug drug addict, and we're like, well, you know that's that's not true. Obviously, there's drug addicts, but there's drug addicts and every, you know. I always went to college, and a lot of my friends were drug addicts. Like you know, but they all had roots and jobs, and you know, children. You know, but um, uh, you know, but the, that's just—it's literally they just parrot this. You know, everybody's a drug addict, and you know, a thing that I like to say is, is that you know, because a lot of people are like, well, they're all drunks. So I just see them. I just see them drinking. I was like, well, you know, most of the people I know that drink all the time all have houses. Like they're all, you know, they're all. My friends, you know, they drink a lot. And if, like, if you're on the street and have nothing going on for you, like, you probably deserve a drink more than pretty much anybody else. So to just take that one thing and persecute somebody for it, I think, is terrible. Um, but, I mean, we don't really have a good solution for dealing with, with addiction in this country at all. Um, and we definitely don't have them, you know, we don't have enough um, bandwidth in terms of, um, programs that we can get people into to, that are that are wanting to deal with their drug problem, and you and that's important. You have to be willing and, and actually want to deal with your problem, or there's not there's not going to be a solution for you. But the people that it's really heartbreaking is that we've had instances where someone has come to us and been like, "Look, I have like I've, I've I can't get off of heroin. I've been trying for years, but like I I, I need help." Um, and they actually come to you, and then we walk them in. We try to get them into some sort of substance abuse program, and they're all full. They're all on six-month waiting lists, you know. And so, like, if we walk someone, someone actually finally, come, you know, gets enough courage to ask another person to help them with their problem, and then you walk them through the doors of a program, and then they're turned away, you know, that rejection at that lowest point in their life, they, they're probably never going to go back to try to get help again. Um, so I mean, we, we you know we could we need lots of substance abuse issues. And, and, I mean programs, and so that's another thing, right, where the government screws it all up, because um, like I can't just go start a substance abuse program. Like I can't I can't just if I guess if I was a church I probably could, um, but uh, like I have to go get licensing, and there's all of this procedure, and you know there's a lot of money involved, and like getting set up just to help people out with that. So, like, I can't even start, like, a support group, really, um, because, it, you know, you need all of the licenses and bullshits for it. Um, and and so that's a way where the government is actually creating an artificial bottleneck um, that's preventing people from getting help. Because, like, if you if you wanted to start a drug treatment facility, 
um, you probably wouldn't have the resources to go through the license and licensing and certification process to do that. Um, so, or you know, so even if you were very interested in it, you'd start down that path, realize what a huge headache it was, and just abandon it. Um, and then, so the end result is is that we don't have enough inventory in terms of programs where we can send people to. Uh, I think another negative perception about homeless people is that you give and you give, and they're just going to take it and not really progress. And I did read on Sean Dalfour's website that you guys have successfully gotten people off the street to permanent. So that kind of goes against that negative perception. Could you elaborate some more on that? Yeah, you know, we, we've we had, I think we're looking at somewhere around 26 people that are not no longer on the streets through our effort over the last year, um, which is small um, because, I mean, there's a lot more homeless people. But I mean, just on that same token, it's you have to want to get help, and there's got to be help available. Um, but yeah, but we, I mean, we do have success, and, and and that's that's the important part is the people that want to better themselves, that want to get off the street, that want that don't want to be there. There's got to be a clear path to get to getting off the street, or else they're just going to always be there, you know. Um, and uh, so how I don't do know. you help them? Have you? I know you. I know you fed the homeless. You provided shelters? Um, have you provided any well, we, I think, jobs? I, yeah, we, we've, act, we've hired some of them. Um, we've helped people get jobs. Um, you know, sort of our most well uh, public, most public cases that we turned a couple of guys onto Bitcoin. They got into Bitcoin, um, started becoming Bitcoiners, and then like made enough Bitcoin to get off the street. And Wired actually did an article on that. Um, you know that's cool, but I mean th those that's you know those are fringe cases that doesn't happen all the time. Um, but I think that you know I think that something that could help that we try to do is try to teach self sufficiency. You know, teach things like uh, you know construction skills. Like we, we have been building small houses for for homeless people, trying to teach organic gar gardening and permaculture things like that. Things that you know that actually teach you self reliance and things like that. Um, because yeah, you know, if you just if you're just gonna sit on a park bench and drink all day and just think about how shitty your life is, like you're not really gonna have an opportunity to do much else than that. So it is important to have you know, um, sort of ha have a way to to be able to like to show a path to being able to not be on the street anymore. Um, and so that's that's sort of what we're working on now. But um, what we've found is is there there are a lot of programs for that. Um, there's a lot of programs that, like, once um, once a homeless person is, like, they get to a certain level of, of self-sufficiency where, you know, they're trying to get off. There are programs for trying to help them get in, them into the workforce or get them educational skills or things like that. Um, connect because as a society, you know, we have we have idioms like, you know, teach a man to... You know, give a man a fish he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish he eats for the rest of his life. That's great. But if the the guy that you're trying to teach to fish is starving and he hasn't eaten in three weeks, like he's not going to remember anything that you're trying to teach him because all he's going to think about is like, oh my god, I'm so hungry. So, um, you know, while there's value in teaching people skills, if if you're not willing to like get them nursed back to health in terms of like not being deal with you know abject hunger, um. Then they're, you're not going to get make any more progress with them. And over the last 20 years, across the whole country, like a lot of municipalities have taken this approach that feeding the homeless is is akin to feeding stray animals, and that you're like making the problem worse by feeding them. So as a result, all of the nonprofits and um, the charitable organizations have sort of uh, honed their specific outreaches away from feeding and into all of these sort of ancillary programs, which while they're very valuable, if all the homeless people starve to death before they can get into your program, then there's not a whole lot of value to them. So, you know, we have to we have to we have to start over. Like the, and then that's like a whole different show is talking about how the whole charity and nonprofit sector is, is completely broken and, and, and is actually geared towards no one actually being able to affect change because everyone's just geared towards uh, trying to get government assistance basically and not really 
working on the problem itself. Yeah, we're out of time now, but if you're ever interested in coming back on to talk about that, that would be fantastic. Just let me know. <laughs> Sure, sure. For, uh, I'd be happy to. So thanks for having me on. I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be your first guest, and I hope your show goes great. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything you're doing, and I hope that some viewers will get involved and donate. Feed the homeless, like you said. Awesome. All right, Whitney. Thanks. Take Bye. care.